Sent Marks Online. We're so glad that you could join us this morning. My name is Grace and I'm the children's ministry leader here at St Marks. And my name is Matt. I'm the ordinand here at St Marks, which basically means vicar in training. And we are married. Yes, we are married. <laughs> you're so welcome. Welcome to St Marks Coventry. Whether you're visiting for the first time or visiting again or whether you're part of the St Marks family, it's so good to be with you this morning. We're an Anglican church based right in the centre of Coventry. And we're also part of a wider network of churches across the UK called the HGB Network. And throughout the month of August, we're really privileged because we've got some content from across the whole HTB network. So this morning, we're going to be starting with worship from HTB Church. And then we're going to be going into an interview led by Nicky Gumbel. Uh, he'll be interviewing international speaker, writer and lawyer Bob Goff. And then we'll have Naomi Maxwell, who is on team at Hackney Church and a fellow vicar in training, will be speaking to us later on. And finally, a little bit closer to home, we've got our very own Simon family who will be bringing us our All Age Challenge this week and we're really excited about that. But before all that, we're going to go into a time of sung worship and we're so blessed, as Grace has said, to have HTB Worship leading us this morning. And actually worshipping and engaging with God through song is something that's so important to us here at St Mark's. So can I encourage you, wherever you're tuning in from, wherever you are, can I encourage you to engage in our time of worship at whatever level you're comfortable with? We're going to sing, but first of all, I'm going to pray. Father, I pray that as we sing, as we worship you, and throughout this morning, as we take a step towards you, as we draw closer to you, could we have a sense of you drawing closer to us? Come Holy Spirit, let us sense your presence with us. Amen. Let's sing.
Dear Lord Jesus, we pray for our world and all those in leadership at this time. We lift up leaders in government, business, the public sector and the church. We ask that you would give them your wisdom, courage and compassion to bring about the healing and change our world so desperately needs. In Jesus' name, Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up the work of Love Your Neighbour across the UK. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to pour out blessing 
and to serve others, especially those who are struggling during this difficult period of time. Continue to strengthen our volunteers as they go out into their communities to show love and express compassion onto others. In Jesus' name, Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray for our NHS and our frontline workers who are working so incredibly hard at this time to serve their communities. We'd ask that you'd strengthen them and that your spirit of peace would just fall and rest upon them. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. In light of the situation that's happened in Beirut this week, let's join together and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up Beirut to you now. You created that land, you created every person in that land, and you love them so, so much. We pray for everyone that is physically injured right now, that you would bring healing to their bodies and strengthen them. And alongside that, we pray for the nurses and the doctors and the hospitals that are dealing with this tragedy, God, that you would give them the strength and capacity to deal with this. We pray for those that are bereaving, that have lost brothers and mothers and sisters and fathers, God, that you would heal their hearts, be close to them in this time and give them your peace. We pray for the leaders of this land, that you would give them dreams and visions of you and your guidance of how to move on from this. God, thank you that you are sovereign and you are in control. So we pray would your will be done and would your kingdom come. for you now we have as mentioned the simon family bringing you our all age fun and if you're a marvel fan this one is definitely for you hi, hi Simons. Simons. we're the simons and today we're doing our all age challenge which is guess the marvel film we've reenacted scenes from some of our favorite marvel films can you guess which ones they are <laughs> How many of these did you get? Excelsior! That 
that was absolutely brilliant. I love the effort that went into that and Matt definitely got more answers correct than I did on that one. Oh yeah, I absolutely loved it. I loved the commitment that Theo and Sasha were showing to each of the characters. It was so good. And the music. Oh, it was so good. Love it. So now we're going to head over to something else. We're going to head over to Nikki Gumbel, who's the vicar at HTB. He's going to be interviewing Bob Goff, who's an international speaker, author and lawyer and quite possibly the happiest man alive. <laughs> See what you think. Check it out. I'm excited to be with Bob Goff. We were hoping that Bob would be at the leadership conference, which we postponed till next year. But Bob Goff is so many things. As a lawyer for 25 years, uh, he is the New York Times bestselling author of this book, which I highly recommend. Love does. I've got a very early copy of this. And one of the things I'm going to ask him about is he gives away his, his telephone number in this book, and it's sold well over a million copies. Uh, and his latest book, Dream Big, is already number three in the New York Times this week. And together with that, he runs a human rights organization. He's a consul to, for Uganda and so many other things. But I don't want to waste any more time in the introduction because uh, he's here. So, Bob, oh. uh, I thought, Tell us about your, I want to hear about all your life. So, I mean, you were a lawyer for 25 years, but it's almost by accident that you ended up as a lawyer, didn't you? Yeah, you know, I uh, I really wanted to be a, a youth minister uh, with this organization. And when I applied, they said, you have to raise all your support. So I did. And when I had all the money, I said, so can I do it? And they said, no. <laughs> I think they didn't think I'd be very good with people. So I went to law school. I'm like, why not? And so my real ambition, Nikki, has always been to be available. Uh, just look at the way Jesus was available to people all the time. And we have a great way to do that now. So when I wrote that book, I thought, let me put my cell phone on the last page of every book I write. I get 100 calls a day. <laughs> it's awesome. I can't get a thing done. I got my first call at four o'clock this morning. In this really groggy voice, I'm like, hello. But there's something about that. Like we, uh, you can't decide where you'll be born. You can't decide so many things, how tall you'll be, but you can decide how available you'll be. And it's not for everybody, but um, I just know that that's what Jesus did. He got more and more available as time went by. And I think that's what you're doing. Uh, that's why HTB has been so important to me. You were available to me in ways before we even became friends. I don't know if you even knew that, but you you were where we started a, a thing with our kids, and it was started uh, on a Christmas Eve service at HTB. That was when what started? We what? started this thing. We wrote to every world leader, leader on earth. We just wrote them a letter from our kids and because it seemed like the world was losing its mind. And, and, and so we said, oh, would you like to come over for a sleepover? Because this was written by my kids at the time. And if you can't come over the sleepover, can we come over to your house and ask you this, what's your hope in? And, and there's something beautiful about that. We sent out the letters all around the world and we got 29 yeses. And so we just pulled the kids out of school. Our first stop was London. Our first stop in London, it was Christmas Eve, HTV. I mean, that was an extraordinary thing, was it? 29 presidents and kings said yes. Isn't that crazy? And, <laughs> and, and interviewed them. I mean, yes. Just say some of the people that you saw. Oh, we started with, uh, there was a guy that had, Tun Mahathir was the prime minister, the leader of Malaysia for so many years. And we had just met with the president of Israel. And this is the kids. These guys don't want to meet with me. These this is the guy like, who was saying yes to your children's letters. And then you yeah, went, just sent a letter. I'm telling you, if you're listening, write the letter. <laughs> and so, uh, so we... We asked the president of Israel, what made you say yes? And he said, I was flying back from Europe and we had the mail and my chief of staff opened this up and said, there are three children in San Diego that have written and said, would, would you do an interview with them? And he said, if they'll come to Jerusalem, I'll meet with them. And I think that sometimes we think that people are unavailable to us who are actually available to us. And the same applies with faith. Sometimes it feels like God is far away and he's just waiting for you to just call out his name. And so when uh, Mahathir had the World Islamic Conference and he said two things, 
death to Israel and death to America. And so our kids wrote and said, hey, we've got a message of hope from the guy from Israel. Can we come and give it to you? <laughs> and Mahatir said, yes. So we sold the pickup truck and we went. And I mean, the way you ran your law firm was a very different way from most people who run their law firm. I'm That's glad. awesome. Yes, we we uh, our law firm went for one year at a time. It had an agreement. If you get a bunch of lawyers, could you imagine how big the agreement would be? It was two paragraphs. It says, my, it's my law firm and it's all over December 31st. And we dissolved that law firm every time December 31st came. So we did that for a quarter of a century. But you also had a resignation letter that you wrote. Yes. Every single, listen to this, every single job on my first day, I write my resignation letter. It's, it was just say two words, I quit. <laughs> I'd put a stamp on it. I'd address it to my new boss and I'd give it to my wife, sweet Maria. And I told her if this job ever gets between me and you or me and Jesus, you mail that thing in. You don't even need to tell me, I'll find out. And there's something beautiful. You might be listening and you might have, have a job that was the perfect job three jobs ago, but you've changed your new creation. When everyone thinks of Bob Goff, they think of love. And this book, Love Does, is uh, all, all about love. But, but one of the things about it was that you, you made an agreement with the publishers that the royalties, even that the, the royalties up front were going to be given to a school. Yeah, I traded them. They said, would you write a book? I said, I don't know. Will you build a school? I'll trade you. And so uh, when we built the school in Uganda, uh, evidently a lot of books got sold. So then we built our next school in Mogadishu, Somalia, and our next one in Iraq. Uh, the, what we've been working on the last two years, Nikki, we started a school in Afghanistan for little girls that the Taliban won't allow to learn how to read and write. And that just chapped me. And so uh, we started a school where we teach little girls how to read and write. So every couple of months, we're back there visiting. But there's something beautiful about this. I don't think Jesus wants us to go across the ocean. I think he's dazzled when we go across the street. Love your neighbor, like right where you are. And you say, I mean, I love the way you say that's not a metaphor. That's love your, it's your literal neighbor. It is your literally neighbor. your neighbor, the one there and there and there. And the creepy thing is some of our neighbors are actually kind of difficult. I don't know about yours, but <laughs> mine are a little difficult. But here's the deal. What I'm learning, I'm a little difficult. <laughs> You know, I'm not for everybody. And if you're listening, you're not either. You are not as lovely as you think you are. But that's where this like this idea of faith comes in to say, Jesus, would you take all the rough parts of Bob Goff and would you use me right here in my community to do something beautiful that I couldn't have done myself? Paul talks to Philippians 2.20. He says, this guy, Timothy, he takes a genuine interest in the people around him. I think that's what we need as new creations. We could just take a genuine interest and we're going to find what we're looking for. If we're looking for people that need a hug, don't give them one, but 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 find something to do that could meet a need. And and, and as a result of your um, work in Uganda, you became a, a consul. A, a <laughs> Isn't that Uganda. awesome? I know I don't. I'm not the U.S. Uh, diplomat to Uganda. I'm the Ugandan diplomat to the U.S. I walk into embassies. They're like, where's the Ugandan guy? I'm like, I'm the Ugandan guy. And there's something beautiful about seeing a country uh, that's just emerged from decades long civil war and just made tremendous strides forward. So we're really enjoying just trying to be helpful. And one of the things I know that you do is Every Thursday, you, you give something up, don't you? I quit something. We call it Quit Thursday. And so every Thursday, I'm like great at accumulating things. I don't know about you. I, I see lots of books you've accumulated in the back of your pictures. <laughs> I know, there. I need to get rid of them. Yeah, I've yeah. accumulated surfboards, like I'm in California. So well, one of the things that's it's easy to do is to accumulate things. What I want to do is let them go. So each Thursday, I just let one thing go. I've got a thing. I don't know if you know this about me. I'm a little quirky, <laughs> as you probably picked up. Uh, but I have no left pockets in any of my clothes. So I have right pockets in my jeans, 
no left pockets. I cut them all out. And it's a reminder to me that there's things you're going to hang on to and things you're going to let go of. And what I'm trying to do is quit some things, take some things that I've been carrying around in my right pocket and move them to my left pocket. I mean, I love so many things about you, Bob. But one, one of the things I love you is that you, you talk a lot about failure. I think, in fact, you lecture on how to fail, don't you, somewhere? Oh, heck yeah. I teach a class at Pepperdine Law School, which is one of our good law schools here in the United States. But I also teach a class at San Quentin Penitentiary, which is a really difficult place to be. And I've got several hundred felons in my class, and we just talk about failure. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there's something beautiful about the authenticity that comes along with just getting real. And I think what God never had problems with people who had a setback. What he had a problem with is people that were faking it and they were acting like they're at, like they've got it together. And I just want to get super real. And these guys are actually my teacher. I, I don't go there to teach. I go there to learn. And we talk about people who get things off their chest. We were actually in the prison yard and they're pumping iron. And we were talking about like, if I was doing that, I'd have the bar across my chest. But I said, what's something you need to get off your chest? And we went around to each guy The the average sentence unserved for these guys 107 years a piece and so to the guy next to me he said I got something to get off my chest I've been in here for 20 years and I've been telling everybody I got framed I didn't do it and he paused a second he said I did it and I'm telling you Nikki he was the freest guy I've ever met in that moment if we could just get these things off our chest move it from your right pocket to your left pocket quit Thursday and you've got some stuff going on in your life you shouldn't be into don't wait till Thursday one of the things where you, I mean, you've had disappointment is I know you you have this amazing place where you you bring people together a kind of retreat a retreat house and you spend a lot of time building it and then it burnt down didn't it or something happened to it isn't that crazy yeah we had some painters out there this is big uh, this immense lodge uh, 10,000 square miles away from the nearest anybody in Canada. It took me 20 years to build. And we had some painters up there. They got their cloths that were co- covered in stain. They put them in a pile, spontaneously combusted. It was gone in 20 minutes. And I think for all of us, we've experienced that. It wasn't necessarily a house that burnt down. It might be a, a relationship. It might be a hope, a career. It might be one of your kids, somebody in your community that you love. And we each have to decide, so what are we going to do next? When we face a setback, what do we do next? And so we decided as a family that we were going to rebuild it. So I bought a big crane. I just started swinging logs. It's interesting that how you deal with critics too, because anyone who's got as high a profile as you now have on through your books and through your, your social media profile, which you're brilliant at, uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, out there. There's some, there's some pretty sort of hostile people, but you have an interesting way of dealing with hostile people, don't you? Of, of, of approaching them, of, of thinking about it. Yeah, you know, if I ever get a tweet or something that somebody is a little bit on edge, I just figure they're probably working on their people skills a little bit. Um, but what I'll do is I'll make myself their student. I'll, uh, I'll go into their feed and read some, to let them try to teach me something uh, before I block them. <laughs> it's like a going away party. But, but what if we, instead of feeling like we need to out shout the next person. Uh, just it, what it does is it caused me to go back to scripture to say, hey, am I right on this thing? I'm, I'm off all the time. And it's usually just a small increment of a change in your marriage, in your relationships, in your faith. It's about a quarter of a twist that'll get you there. So you care passionately about issues of justice and you do something about them. So say yeah. a little bit about that. Why, why do you feel so passionately about justice issue? I think we're just hardwired from the factory to well, want justice. I think everybody has that deep desire. You you know what it feels like to, when somebody is unfair to you, and that is pinging something within each of us. So what I just decided is use what I'm good at. I'm a I'm a lawyer, so I thought let's go. We tried the first death penalty case in Uganda against a witch doctor who sacrificed children, which is really really creepy stuff. But but I just feel like I don't want to circulate a petition. I actually want to stop. There's no love without justice but there's no justice without love yeah and right now with the with the george floyd uh, murder and so on um how how, what 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 is 
what are you seeing happening in um well, the US? people mm -hmm. are raising their voices as we've all seen on the news and appropriately so to, to have a passion and to say, this is not happening anymore. But I don't think that it's a uh, binary. You talked a, a lot about faith as we've been talking. Just say what, what difference has faith made for you in your life? And how did you find faith? And what difference has that faith made? What I'm trying to do, Nikki, is plant a vineyard. Because I've just been reading about it my whole life. I don't know anything about grapes. But what I needed to do is clear the brush first. And so I have this brushing machine and I clear all the brush away. You know what's under the brush? The rattlesnakes. <laughs> and I found a couple. Well, one of the things about faith is it helped me kind of clear the brush in my life, some of the distractions, some of the things. And it, God uses really imperfect people to bring us to faith. Well, I was moving my excavator underneath an oak tree. You know what I hit? A beehive. 10,000 bees yesterday landed on the top of my excavator <laughs> with me in it. You know what? There was a door and I shut the door. And while all the bees are going crazy, wanting to sting me, I'm on the inside. And what faith also taught me is things that I could shut the door to. I could just say, you know what? I'm, I'm just not going to be doing those things. God didn't die on a cross so we'd behave better. He, he came so we could have the opportunity to shut the door to some things and open the door to others. And what will happen if we clear a little brush in our life? I wonder what we'll find underneath. You'll find some scary stuff, but you're also going to find some good stuff. Brilliant, Bob. Thank you so much. Really oh, blessings good. on you and I your family. Jesus be over each one. And uh, just so grateful for the larger church family there, too. You guys stick together. You are bright lights in our life. We are watching you as you guys lead with love. And we're learning a lot. Bob Goff, thank you so, so much. We hope you enjoyed that. We found it so inspiring. I'm pretty sure Bob could well be the happiest man alive. <laughs> Now is time to head over to Naomi Maxwell. Naomi is going to be giving us our talk for this morning. Naomi is a member of the team at Hackney Church in London and she is going to be talking to us this morning about the power of the invitation. Take a look. Hi, I'm Naomi and I'm on the leadership team here at Hackney Church in East London. And today I want to talk to you about the power of the invitation. I feel so inspired after listening to Nikki's interview with Bob Goff. It's such a good talk. I watched the whole thing with a notepad, three pens, a whole box of highlighters. I just wanted to glean every bit of gold that I could. Because if I'm honest, this past season has sent a fair few challenges our ways. Whether it's the lockdown or the economy, whether it's suddenly becoming a teacher on top of your day job, or holding uncomfortable conversations around race and inequality, if you've got to this point in the year and you're also feeling a bit out of breath or in need of a really long nap, please know that you are not alone. This has been a really full on season. Speaking personally, I lost my grandma right at the beginning of the lockdown. And it's safe to say that she was my best friend. Like many West Indian children, she was pretty much a third parent. My grandma was really naughty and she had the best sense of humor. But alongside that playfulness, my grandma Tapper personified hospitality. Her door was always open. There was always food for when a visitor turned up unexpectedly. Always a prayer before they left, having shared their burdens with her, knowing that she would listen and not judge. And as grandchildren, we saw it all. Single mothers, recovering addicts, adults with additional needs. Everyone was welcome at her table. And everyone knew that Grandma Tapper would talk with you and cuddle you and pray for you. And there was no way that you could leave her house without feeling different. And whilst I'm only able to recognize it now as an adult, she was so intentional about assuring her grandchildren that they were enough and that they had value and worth. It reminds me just how much it is a blessing to receive love like that, but also to be able to give it away. Because as life got rocky, my grandma was the steadiest foundation. After feeling burnt out during my studies, it wasn't home that I went back to, it was my grandma's. 
After trying to flesh out a faith of my own and not one just borrowed from my parents, it was my grandma who handed me a Bible and a pen and set me loose. And after sensing a call to ministry, it was my grandma who playfully took the credit and said that it was her pious example that had drawn me into church leadership, even if I didn't know that myself. You see, I learned how to show and receive love from the woman who demonstrated it unconditionally, who showed me the true power of invitation, one that invites you into relationship, into acceptance and into recognising your value. So often in life, we just need someone to extend an invitation, to invite us, to show us what God's love can really look like in practice. And whilst we can't all have a grandma tapper, I've got good news for you. God's love is an even bigger invitation and he's inviting us into it today, however we may be feeling. One of my favourite stories in the Gospels is the story of Zacchaeus. It's one of those stories that we all kind of know how it goes. You learn about it in Sunday school. I even had a puzzle of it as a child. But there's a reason that it's so popular. It's full of gold when it comes to the power of the invitation. Let's take a look at the story together. The passage is found in Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. What a story. I love that this happened as Jesus was passing through. That this wasn't something on the schedule or the agenda, but that he slowed down enough to notice someone who'd been shunned and was an outcast. Now, I don't know what your first reaction to Zacchaeus might have been, but mine definitely wouldn't have been hospitality. I feel like I would have been much quicker to judge than to break bread with this wealthy tax collector. But that's where I love Jesus. You see, Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus, means pure and innocent in Hebrew. And yet he'd managed to fall so far from the person that God had made him to be. But rather than condemnation, what Zacchaeus needed was for someone to demonstrate love to him. For someone to see through the cracks, through the bad habits and through those bad actions, straight to the heart of who he had been made to be. So as Jesus called out to him, inviting him into relationship, he also called out the gold within him. For he could see who Zacchaeus was and all that he was capable of. And in that moment, Zacchaeus' true identity and purpose were catalyzed as this man who had been bound by money and greed was liberated to give it all away for the service of others. We might feel like Zacchaeus, like our pasts have made us unworthy or that they're a bit complicated to say the least. But God is calling you into relationship with him and he's asking whether you'll invite others in too, whether you'll be inclusive. Because that's what love does. It pursues us. It changes us. It says that we get to be a part of the story, that we can respond to the love of Jesus. And you may never know the impact that showing such love can have, especially for those who truly struggle to see value within themselves. If you had told me at 18 that I'd become a church leader, I would have laughed at you for like a good half hour. You see, there was no way that I could have seen anything of that level of value within myself. It took women like my grandma. It took being in church community and around healthy leaders. And ultimately it took the goodness of God working through relationship and through the spirit for me to even get to a place where I could accept this calling. In the example that those people gave me, in their affection and their warmth and ultimately their invitation, propelled me into a life of faith. 
and into imagining what ministry could look like and why it was so vital that we see those around us and point them to the person of Jesus. That we point them to the one who repairs, to the one who restores, to the one who says, I must have dinner with you. I want your time and your company. Wherever you are watching this from, I wonder who might be right in front of you that really needs to be seen. Who have you accidentally overlooked because that outer shell was a bit rough around the edges or because their demographic seemed so different from yours? When Jesus looked at Zacchaeus, he saw the true heart within, the desire to glimpse something of God, the willingness to look a fool and climb a tree just to be able to observe God. And as Jesus' invitation began to strip away the shame and stigma of his past, he was empowered to shrug off the old and pick up the new. You see, he wanted to participate. He wanted to help. His heart was completely transformed. When we invite people into our lives, we are inviting them to come along on this journey of faith with us, to learn about Jesus together. If you're new to Christianity, I'd love to encourage you to try Alpha. It's all about having a space to ask the big questions in life. Because when we grasp hold of this invitation, when we offer it to others, everything changes. History gets rewritten, chains get broken, the world is turned upside down as people encounter a love so radical that all they can do is give everything away. There is no doubt in my mind that you can have a lasting impact on the world around you, that you can make a difference. And I believe that today Jesus is calling your name and inviting you onto the greatest adventure of your life. Seize it. It will be the best thing that you ever do. Amen. 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 I hope you enjoyed that. We absolutely loved that. We loved everything that Naomi was saying about the power of the invitation. And we just want to leave a bit of space right now. This is what we normally do here at St. Mark's. We leave space for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, to come and speak to us. You may find there's some things that have stood out to you this morning. It could have been in, a, in Bob's interview. You know, something that stood out to me was when he talked about being accessible, making yourself more accessible. And I wonder if that relates to what Naomi was saying about the power of the invitation, making yourself more accessible to extend the invitation to the person right in front of you, whoever that may be. It could be anything, whatever it is, we're just gonna ask the Holy Spirit to come and to reveal more to us, to speak more to us, to make things clear. So come Holy Spirit, we need you. Come Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. Come Holy Spirit. And maybe as you're waiting, you just need to be reminded that you are loved by God, that Jesus wants to come to your house, that he extends that invitation to you, that there's nothing that could get in the way of that invitation, nothing that you've done, nothing that you've thought, nothing that is in your life that could get in the way of God inviting you, that of Jesus wanting to knock on your door and invite himself in for tea. Uh, and maybe you just need to be reminded of that this morning, that the love of God is so deep for you um, so as you just as you just reflect, just let that sink in and just remember that Jesus is knocking on your door and are you going to answer, are you going to invite him in? Well, you may be relating to that. Maybe there is a sense, maybe you've never let Jesus in and maybe there's a desire to or, or maybe you've let him in before and you're doing it for the hundredth time. You know, it, it doesn't matter. There's, there's no limit to letting Jesus in. So I'm just going to say a brief prayer and this may be the first time you say it, it could be the hundredth time, it doesn't matter. If you'd like you can join in. This is an opportunity to turn around like Zacchaeus did and that's what repentance is, kind of acknowledging where we've got it wrong, just like Zacchaeus did. He acknowledged where he got it wrong and he took the opportunity to turn around. It was that encounter with Jesus that made all the difference. So we're gonna pray, we're gonna pray this. And if you'd like to echo this prayer, please do. Please just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I hear you inviting me in, thank you. I acknowledge all the bad stuff, all the mistakes I've made. 
And if there's anything that's coming to mind when I say that, just think about it. Just offer it up to God and ask for his forgiveness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me so that I could be forgiven. Pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would come to live in my heart. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you found yourself praying that, it could be for the first time, please do get in touch. Get in touch on office at stmartscommentary.org. You know, we want to carry on the conversation. You may have loads of questions and uh, we want to point you in the right direction. We want to point you to things like Alpha, which is a, a course, an opportunity to explore the big questions of life and to explore, it's like an introduction to the Christian faith. So you'd be more than welcome to do that. But please do get in touch, office at stmartscommentary.org. Time is against us, so we are going to go into our final song of worship. We're going to sing together like we did earlier. And this may be a new song to many of us, but it's one of my favourite songs right now. It's a song about God's faithfulness. I absolutely love it. And there's one moment in the song where it says, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my rock and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. And when we get to that point in the song, why don't we bring all these things that have come to mind during this morning, bring them all together and intentionally put our faith in Jesus again. Use it as an opportunity to reflect further on these things and to ask the Spirit to speak to us. So let's do it. We're going to sing together again.
everyone for joining in with us. That's all we've got for this week. We hope that you had a great morning and we'll see you next week. Just before you go, just want to let you know about a couple of things that we've got going on throughout the month of August. We're currently running the prayer course, which is on, on a Tuesday evening, 7.30. Information on that is on our website, stmarkscommentary.org. And just to say, if you'd like to join us for prayer in another way, Tuesday morning at 8.30, we gather together to pray over Zoom. All the information is on the website. Go check out stmarkscommentary.org. We'd love to see you there. But otherwise, have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.